What's up WordPress nerds? In today's video, I wanna walk you through a couple of tips that I have when it comes to avoiding tech debt when working with WordPress. So if you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you get notified of my weekly WordPress videos. All right, let's jump into it. I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit today about tech debt. And so I kind of labeled this group of slides as how I learned to stop worrying and love my future self. And this kind of ties into a coworker that I have who considers himself a lazy developer. And lazy developer is in gigantic air quotes because he's not a lazy developer by uh, any stretch of the term really. But what he does very well is that he sets himself up very well for the future. And that means that he does all the work up front so that he can be lazy in the future. And so technical debt is a big part of that idea. And so I want to walk you through a couple of scenarios that could be considered sources of technical debt and then some tips on how to avoid them and or remedy, remedy them. So first things first is what is tech debt? And so this is just pulled straight from Wikipedia. It's a concept in software development that reflects the implied cost of additional rework caused by choosing an easy, limited solution now instead of using a longer or using a better approach that would take longer. So you take the easy route now so you can um, <laughs> have to go back later and redo it. Or you can take the longer route now and not have potentially not have to go back later and rework it. So technical debt is something that can creep up on you, and it is a very easy. Um, it's a very easy thing to get out of hand. Um, I know this firsthand because uh, what I've been currently doing over the past couple of years in my current position is I've been uh, uh, recovering the company uh, that I work for from uh, a large amounts of technical debt. So what does uh, tech debt look like while freelancing? And so that's kind of the area that I wanna focus on, um, particularly with freelancing, but uh, this can be applied to most scenarios when working with WordPress. I think that you can apply this absolutely to an enterprise sense, and that's mostly the experience that I have. While I have lots of freelancing experience, I my most um, in-depth uh, tech debt uh, experience has come from the enterprise level. So let's take a look at um, the first possible tech debt scenario, which is an inconsistent tech stack. So this is the one thing that you have arguably the most control over as a freelancer, um, less so if you are in um, the enterprise level. However, um, it's not impossible. But the main thing that I think that uh, people run into here is that you have, if you're like me, you're like the, you want to, you want to play with whatever is the, the newest and the shiniest. Um, however, that uh, can quickly change um, the next time that you have a freelance project. So in one scenario, you may just be super excited about Gutenberg. And then the next time you have a client, you're all of a sudden doing it in WordPress and Gatsby, um, like a headless WordPress and Gatsby. Or then the next time you're like, well, let me just use Elementor. And then the time after that, let me use something else. I think it will drastically reduce how much technical debt you have if you have a simple starter theme and you are able to build off of that on most of your clients' uh, sites. Now, that doesn't mean that this is a one-size-fits-all solution. There could definitely be a, a place where building a theme from or building a theme off of a starter theme that you create might not make sense. Of course, there's scenarios like that. However, if you have the option to, you know, go off of your starter theme and just kind of make it a regular WordPress site. You know, custom built or whatever, or something a little bit more fancy. I would say that in order to kind of be kinder to your future self, that you stick with something that is uh, more consistent. 
And so I think a, a, a good starter theme would have good asset compiling. It would be a, uh, a theme that like removes a lot of the bloat, like it removes emojis from the front end. Like I, silly that that's a thing that's just WordPress comes with. Um, you could have it set up with bedrock and a default set of plugins. So all you have to do is composer install, and then you have all your plugins. You don't have to go and like, remember, oh, I always use ACF and CPT UI and I always have Yoast. So let me go install all those real quick. You just have that in your starter repository hit, you know, composer install and you're good to go. And then I was kind of toying with this idea that most of your freelance projects could potentially have a shared parent theme and that you could have a private repository or a public repository for that matter with uh, all of your kind of bloat removal and all that kind of stuff. So in case like, you know, in the example of, of Gutenberg, where it, it just like happens when you upgrade to WordPress 5.0 and, and up that, and you wanted to disable it across the site, you can either update your, your, your composer um, or your composer JSON with the the default uh, or the removal of Gutenberg, or you can uh, have the um, a, a parent theme that just disables it, and then you just go in and update the sites that you want to update, and it would pull in that new logic and it would remove um, Gutenberg and bring you back to the classic editor. So I think that there is a couple things that you can do there. Of course, this is going to um, need to fit you personally and the projects that you deal with. But I think having the most consistent stack among among your uh, uh, clients, if possible, would be great. So this one's a little bit out of your control for the most part. Um, so scattered hosting providers, if you have one person on Bluehost, another person on SiteGround, a third person on Kinsta, a fourth person on GoDaddy, and then you know you have a couple that you host yourself on DigitalOcean or something like that. More on AWS and Google Cloud. Like it, it's really difficult to, you know, keep track of all that. Who's who? Where's what? Where's what? And all that kind of stuff. So I would suggest, in in the name of avoiding possible tech debt, if you can keep as many clients as possible on the same service, that's great, right? Like if you have eight clients and you can uh, have all eight of them on site ground, let's say, and you know, that would be awesome. Cause then you don't have to juggle all these different services and who uses cPanel, who uses something else. Like you automatically know exactly what you're up against every time that you are revisiting an older client's website. Now, many clients have their own hosting already set up. Many of them will be coming to you and saying like, where should I host? This is also a good potential place to um, talk about your favorite hosting place. So if you like Kinsta, then you can, you know, say, hey, you know what? You guys currently are on Bluehost and, you know, your site would do much better off of a service like Kinsta, get it over here, all that kind of stuff. The, the client wins because they're getting a better service you are now having an easier time managing the the code and, and the deployment and on top of that you could also have like an affiliate link or something and say like if you and if you use my link you can get some extra um dough on top of that so like i think that if you can consolidate as many as possible that's great so it also time it will keep your deployment workflow pretty consolidated as well um, in the example of kinsta you can you know do like get deployments or something like that. Or um, if they're on SiteGround, you have your, your repository workflow right there. Um, and so if people are on Bluehost or if they're on GoDaddy or if they're on SiteGround and on different hosting plans, um, that becomes a little bit harder to keep track of. And then your maybe your, your, your de default deployment workflow isn't as, uh, is useful in some of those other hosting platforms. So if you can keep them all consolidated, that's good too. Uh, the third possible tech debt is what's called bit rot, which is something that uh, a new kind of term that I've learned recently. But what it means is that kind of like the, uh, just like the code that you write yourself and just kind of how it's going to balance out um, long-term versus short-term when you're rewriting it for that client. Um, this kind of goes back to the original kind of definition of, of technical debt in that you are doing something the quick and easy way, but it may not be in your best interest long term. So 
obviously if you are working on a client that's not paying you a ton of money you just it's a turn and burn website you just need to get it done yeah go for it you do go the short route like i don't think that there's um you know especially if you're not being paid to to like you know think out these long-term uh, solutions for a short-term problem then yeah just get it done move on you need to worry about how much you're getting paid and and kind of ultimately um with what you're being paid, you can obviously, uh, uh, give the correct solution for that. Um, but I would say that create an extendable solution when possible. Um, and a really good way to think about this is like, if you are building, um, like a product search or something like that, or a filter list, like you have a sidebar that has all the different products, uh, categories and, you know, kind of like you would see on Amazon, sorted by rating, sorted by popularity, sorted by um, brand, all those kind of things. It's really easy to take that initial design and that initial concept and kind of just hard code that logic in there. However, if you're, it's a, you know, a client that you plan on keeping around and you're managing the site for them, make it so you can extend that in the future. Um, make it so it's easy for yourself to sim- to add additional taxonomies or meta in there. There's all you will be doing by hard coding in there is making it harder for your future self. So ask your question, how will I update this feature down the uh, feature down the road? And that could include, I'm not going to try and spend time to like list out all the possible scenarios, but I think that you use filters for use filters to your advantage, build out things in an MVC model. Like you should, that MVC is your friend. WordPress doesn't make you do that, but you can absolutely write MVC friendly code in your WordPress theme or plugin. So just try and think about that. Um, and if you're not, if you're unsure about MVC and kind of like what that actually means, I would strongly recommend you know looking up some other tutorials. I don't have one currently. If you guys are interested in me uh, going over that, I'll absolutely absolutely do that. Um, but yeah, I think just kind of thinking about what it would be like to update this in the future is a really good question to ask yourself. And I think it'll answer a lot of your questions when you ask yourself. Um, the last one's kind of a stretch when it comes to tech debt. Um, it's, but it does kind of help your future self. And so I included it in here. Um, it's just port plot project planning um, can hurt you quite a bit. Uh, so what I would suggest is ask a lot of questions up front. It's really easy to see a design that has a filter list or something like that, or has a product page. Um, and the client will just make a lot of assumptions about it because of course it would work this way. Um, so, and you'll kind of get this more and more as you have more experience, obviously, but asking the right kind of questions to kind of dig the expectations out of the client and the designer and kind of like, why is this here? What does this button do? <laughs> because there's lots of times where that button could uh, look super simple, but it has a lot of implications and just being aware of what is being asked and asking questions to figure out what's being asked is super important. So I would say once you have figured out what the client is expecting, uh, make sure that you get all of those features set into your contract and you are being paid for them. Uh, and that way, if you know s- something comes up later and it's not in this feature set that you can actually have a leg to stand on when you ask for more money. And then finally set a generous timeline for yourself if possible to accommodate all that. Nothing s- will give you more tech debt than a t- tight timeline. You aren't. You won't be able to um, actually build out the features that you need to in order to make your thing, your your project, more friendly for you in the future um, than a short timeline. You you absolutely have to give yourself as much time as possible, um, obviously within reason, um, to get this these things done and done right. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is little to no QA and QC. So when up until recently, I only knew what QA meant. And I thought that I knew what a QA meant, actually. Um, and I had no idea what QC was. And uh, I've recently started working with a project manager who's obviously way smarter than me when it comes to this stuff. Um, and then QA and QC are actually uh, different things. Quality assurance and, and uh, quality control are are two different things and these 
both of these things and making sure that you have them in place will lead to less problems down the road, i.e. less tech, less tech debt. So test-driven development um, can be something that will be uh, kind of a, like a QC item. So quality control means things that you're doing to make sure that your code is good and that it's correct and that it's not going to throw errors, things like that. Um, and so test-driven development can help out with that right out of the gate. Now, I'm not saying that you need to do this on like every single freelance client that, you know, is a brochure site or need, you need to, you know, have, it's like almost has no functionality. It's going to be largely useless to do TDD. However, if you're doing a larger enterprise site where, you know, there's a lot of things going on and you absolutely need to be careful that your data is coming back correctly from the API or that it's, you know, being inserted in, in, in the proper format into the database, things like that. Absolutely do. That's a good quality control item. Now, quality assurance is something that makes sure that your quality control is going well. So things like end-to-end -end testing can eliminate many bugs from making it to production. So you have, like, uh, you know, once you push it up to, you know, a, um, a pull request, you have a pull request made, and then it runs a build, and then it'll do its end-to-end -end testing, and that will essentially validate all of your quality control that you did locally. So it's something that <laughs> QA is the... QC for QC. Um, I know it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around, but I think that it kind of makes sense that you would quality control your quality control, and that will make lots of, uh, um, it will give you a lot of benefits long term to put in that extra work up front. And then lastly, I think this is the very last bullet point here is uh, set up a staging server. Like I think that as much as it's a lot more work up front, like having a place where you can go and deploy your code on a separate server to make sure that everything looks good, um, make sure that everything is the way that you expect it to be, will make it so that you will have less reverts, you'll have to less, you know, backup restores, all sorts of things like that. So as much as that one's a little bit stretch, a stretch about technical debt in of itself, I think it will still kind of fall under that same vein of, of saving yourself um, from yourself long term. So anyway, I hope you guys found these uh, kind of tips helpful. If you want me to spend a little bit more time on any one of these, leave me a comment down below. I'd be happy to go over something, some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to kind of uh, go a little bit further in depth with uh, theme development and things like that. I have a Patreon and we're starting to do exclusive videos. The second exclusive video is coming out this week and we're going to be taking a look about theme development kind of from scratch and kind of how I go about things personally. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit more for uh, the uh, beginner, the, the intermediate advanced group. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, the link is also down below. But I appreciate the support, guys. I su super support uh, appreciate the support of my patrons the, who have been supporting me through this all like I couldn't do it without them definitely not um, but I appreciate you guys watching and I will see you next week <laughs>